Welcome to the Lucent Lands podcast. We have identified the need for a platform where industry leaders and innovators in the agricultural sector can share their stories and inspire others. We hope you enjoy listening to this as much as we enjoyed speaking to these people. Welcome. Good morning and thank you so much for um, taking time to chat to us. Um, as the person at the helm of the citrus industry, I can imagine it's been a very rough ride for quite a number of years and you're very busy. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to chat to us and um, maybe just start off with telling us how are things looking in 2023 for the citrus industry? Yeah, no, thanks, Louise. Thanks for the opportunity. So um, although the last couple of years have been difficult, uh, I've been in the industry now for 22 years, probably a bit past my um, sell-by date. But uh, in, in the majority of those 20 years, the, the 22 years, the, the industry's actually had a really good ride. Um, and in fact, 2020 was the best year I've ever experienced in terms of volumes and, and value back to the, the growers. Um, but 21 and 22 definitely meant very, very difficult. And, um, uh, you know, 21 uh, was, was largely around freight rate increases, et cetera, 22 around various geopolitical issues and weather-related issues. So 22 was the most difficult I've ever experienced in the industry. And the study by BFAP shows that four out of five growers actually made a loss last year. So we are in a difficult survival mode at the moment. I saw that in your in your um, uh, from the desk of the CEO right at the end of the year that four out of five citrus growers made a loss. That must be a very very difficult situation for each of them in their personal capacity because I mean the 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 farmer is actually the, where the buck stops. I mean if you think about how many people are dependent on the farmer other than just the farmer, um, everybody in the chain got their money, but the farmer's out of pocket. Yeah, and I think that's the difficult part that we've got to deal with. Um, uh, and and it's, it's sort of sharpened our looking at a value chain approach rather than just looking at the grower. So until now, and still now, the, the, the grower is the most important uh, um, person to the, to the CGA. But in fact, if we just concentrate on, on the grower, we actually uh, are not going to um, bring about any change. Um, it's really important that all in the value chain understand what is going on in the economics of, of citrus farming now, because um, they all taking their slices, as, as you've said, and um, that's not to say whether it's unfair slice or a, or a fair slice, but they're all taking their slice. Uh, and at the moment, the growers left with nothing. And in fact, many growers had to pay in last year uh, for the privilege of being able to export citrus. Um, so I think one of our big um, um, things that we're trying to do now is to to inform the, the 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 value chain and the value chain members and the service providers of the present position that we are in or that the citrus farmers are in, so that we can all sharpen our pencils and and make sure that um, that the grower continues to to survive and in fact uh, to prosper because without the product you don't have the rest of the value chain. So um, that's the. That's the um, objective at the moment, is to engage with, with all the uh, service providers, all the input suppliers, et cetera, et cetera, and make them aware of it um, and, and you know, make sure that the value chain actually operates efficiently and that there's enough money at the end of the day for the product to continue being produced um, and the consumer continue to consume. Yes, so that's, that's a big job that you are tackling because the supply chain is so vast and there's some people who really don't want to hear about this. And what, what, what's, the, what's the feedback been from the people that, you, that you've spoken to? Um, interesting, <laughs> because um, some of them don't want to hear our sob story. Um, you know, they believe the growers always made money and so, you know, what's the difference now? Um, some are sympathetic um, and listen and say, yes, let's try and uh, make it all work. So. I think the, the the important thing is to ensure that everybody has got a positive outlook in the future of the industry. Um, the industry has grown every year. Uh, it's just been in this upward spiral for the last 22 years, um, with a little blip now and again for weather-related or other factors. But in general, it's just been increasing at seven to nine percent every year, um, and it's. In the last five to ten years, there have been massive planting, specifically in the lemon sector and the, and the, and the mandarin sector. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, we show this graph, our long-term model, that shows this continued increase in the, in the volumes going forward for the next 10 years and even longer. Because there's young trees still in the ground. A lot of young trees that haven't even come into production yet. So, um, so what, we've, what the long-term model shows us is that in 10 years' time, in 2032, uh, we're going to be at 260 million cartons. So at the moment, you're 160, 10 years' time, 260. That's 10 million on average a year. Okay. A massive increase. Now, whenever we've shown that to the board in the past or others, they said, oh, that's the death knell of the industry because you go to that volume and you oversupply markets and, and, and you crash. So we had our um, strategic planning session in October last year with the board, and we said, why don't we, we turn that around and say, what, what if we can actually sell 260 in 10 years' time, 260 million cartons in 10 years' time? What would that do to the economy? What would that do to, to foreign exchange earnings? What would that do to jobs? What would that do for the industry to be a huge global player now? Already we're number two in the world, but that'll you know, put us even uh, more firmly into number two. Spain is about six million tons. We'll be at four million then, so it's, it's, it's catching up. Um, and, and the board uh, adopted that as, as sort of a vision 260, which we're calling it now. So that's what we're selling to the, the different um, stakeholders in the value chain to say, if we get to 260, your business increases as well. Yes. Um, so we've, we've met with various, uh, I'm, I'm now in a sort of three month process of meeting with all of these um, uh, service providers, input suppliers uh, along the value chain and, and selling them the 260 vision to say, be part of this. Um, I mean, think about packaging, for example. Yes. So we had, a, we had a, a session with SAPI last year who provide all the cardboard. Um, and we actually ran short of cardboard last year at 160 million cartons, you know. So now we go to 260. Um, so meeting with them and saying, will you have enough board for us um, when we get to 260? What does your capacity look like? Um, we've been meeting with, um, uh, with Impact and, and uh, uh, Howers and uh, APL around the cartons. You know, have you got capacity to make 260 million cartons in 10 years' time? If not, perhaps you should start looking at putting that capacity in place. So that's the whole idea is to, to make sure that everything in the, in the chain, I mean, small things, labeling, you know, yes. any of that's missing for the 260, you don't get to 260 because there's not that. Yes, um, because gonna, it's, that's going to yeah. create the bottleneck. Exactly. So, so th that's our big discussion. But by far, the, you know, you, coming back to the difficult circumstances that the industry's in, the, the freight rates last year killed us. Um, and I know I've been criticized in the media by the shipping lines to say, you know, how can I make these statements? Well, I make these statements because every grower tells me that's the case. Every grower. You know, every grower said, if the rate, freight rates were reasonable last year, would you have made a profit? And they said, yeah, we'd have made a small profit. The other input prices had all gone up and whatever, but we still would have turned a profit. Freight rates killed them. So we have to deal with that. And that's, uh, we've got a big project now going with the other fruit industries because you can't just sort out citrus. Yes. This is happening in the other sectors as well. And, and so you've got to get a year round solution with all the fruit industries in. So we've got a big project going now to look at alternatives. So it's not to say we're going to start chartering our own vessels or building our own ships or whatever, but we've got to look at all the options. We cannot be held to ransom um, so, again in the future as we were last year. And then the shipping companies publish these exorbitant profits that they've made so somewhere something's not right yeah so so they're not they're not charging what they do because they have to they're charging what they to do because they can yes so the, so the the problem we have two shipping lines that have got a huge monopoly in south africa 85 percent of fruit out of south africa go through those two shipping lines so um you know they can pretty much call the shots in terms if you want to send your fruit last year for example if you want to send your fruit to canada he has the price. Take it or leave it. There's nobody else you can go to. Nobody else is going to ship your food to Canada. Is, is it, does the shipping work like airplanes where like an airliner needs to apply for a license to fly to South Africa? Does it work like the same with the ships? Uh, in terms of birthing rights, yes. Okay. So, so if, you, if, if there's a certain amount, number of birthing uh, opportunities at each of the ports, and if you've got those slots, then obviously you're in a good position. Yes. But that's not to say that there's any huge barriers to entry to new lines coming in. Um, so that definitely is, is probably the preferred option is to bring more competition into the space. Mm. Um, 
the, unfortunately, the ports haven't been operating at a great efficiency, which makes the um, attractiveness of coming into the market uh, not that, that attractive because you don't want your vessel sitting outside Cape Town for 10 days waiting to come in because that's Occurring 10 costs. wasted days. Yeah. So, so the, the, you know, it's not just the shipping has to be sorted out, the, the ports have to be sorted out as well. And, uh, and that's probably the, the second biggest challenge going forward is just to, to get the ports efficient because to move to 60 million, you know, you're moving 160 million and, and Transnet did a fantastic job to move 160 million last year, albeit not at the right time <laughs> and with some delays, which, which obviously impact on perishables. But they did move 160 last year, but to move 260, is going to seriously um, yeah. be a, a, a lot of, um, you know, the, the efficiencies just probably won't manage at the moment. So, yeah, we've got to deal with that. And but, what's the other countries doing? How's their growth looking like? Well, unfortunately, that's the issue is, is, is everybody's been planting. You know, I mean, it's if you have a sector that's doing well, then, then everybody sp fills the space because obviously it would seem that demand then is higher than supply. So supply tries to catch up to the demand and, and the price comes down as your, as your demand, as your supply increases to meet that demand. So if we look around the world, um, Australia, who compete with us in Asia, they've been increasing their volumes, not, not extraordinarily like ours, but, but increasing. But in South America, um, Peru specifically is going big increases in their volumes. And Chile, um, um, to a lesser extent, Uruguay, um, and then on the lemon sector, Argentina. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So I'm thinking about what you're talking about, swinging it around instead of saying, we're going to, oh, it's terrible that we're going to have such a massive crop, that you're turning it around and you're actually making it a goal to work towards. It's a paradigm shift to actually say to everybody, it's coming. Are you ready? Get yourselves ready. Because in, in many ways, it's actually very exciting because many, many jobs will grow and many, many industries will develop. So to do that preemptively is actually a pretty good approach. Um, I know that you've, you've touched on the challenges. Um, what kind of comments or feedback have you had from people and um, all the service providers, private and government, about, about this approach and how's it going? So we... Behind the Vision 260, we've got nine projects. Um, um, so we, we looked at what are the nine things that we need to do to make it happen. So ports, warehousing, I mean, you know, coal stores is enough capacity there. If we get the new EU regulations in, that's going to even bring more pressure on the, on the warehousing. Roads and rail, uh, it's a mess. You know, if you, if you try and drive between Johannesburg and Durban now, it's just the inside lane is just a conveyor belt of trucks. There's accidents every day. Um, there's um, issues around uh, s s uh, service level uh, protests that bring the, the roads to close and, and all the rest. We can't afford that. If, you, if you're moving 260, you've got to, those trucks have to move every day and they cannot be held up. Um, when we had the rights uh, insurrection in KZN, uh, those roads were closed off for weeks at a time. That, that's just not possible in the future. And then the floods. And, and then the floods stopped us getting into Durban. So um, to come to your question in terms of we've engaged with the DG of, of Agriculture. He's very excited about this, um, um, this project. Um, and and, and he's, you know, he's, he supports it. Um, we just, you know, we, part of the, of the 260 is, is one is the logistics we've chatted about. The other is the market demand. Because you, you have to have somebody to consume and buy all that fruit. So we're doing a big almost like playing Big Brother and saying, okay, we've got to, ex we've got to um, uh, sell another 200,000 tons. Where are we going to sell it to? You know, so then you go and look at what are the countries importing from other South Southern Hemisphere countries at the moment? What uh, are the importers doing in the Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere? Can we increase per capita consumption? You know, all of those sort of things. So, so we're looking at that, but in terms of, of market access, we depended upon Department of Agriculture and their plant health division particularly, because they do all the negotiations. So we can supply them with the best research in the world, which we do as a citrus industry grows, invest 160 million rand a year into research, which is a massive investment. Um, so, so the department is equipped with the, the best research to use in their negotiations, and we need them to be um, active, uh, enthusiastic, energized, agile to, to actually um, just keep 
going and, and, and opening up those new markets or um, ensuring that um, that those market access is, is optimized in terms of we're taking best advantage of that. It just go a little bit quicker. Mm. It has happened quicker, yeah. I mean, market access in itself is a long-term project. So, I mean, some markets, if you look at Chinese access, for example, most most of your uh, negotiations take 10 years to complete. Mm. So, it's a... It's a 10 years' time, we're going to sit at 260. No, so fortunately, very fortunately for the citrus industry is that when, the, when we had the board structure and we had the citrus board and outspan, they were incredibly active at opening new markets, more active than the other uh, fruit sectors. So we, in fact, have got access to just about every market that we need to have access to. It's optimizing that access that we need to now um, get done. So, for example, we have access to the USA, but we don't have access to the USA out of the Western Cape and Northern Cape um, because of, of old citrus black spot regulations, which are no longer relevant because Florida has citrus black spot now. So, but that, that's been sitting on the sector of the, the, the application and has been finalized, gone through all the, the technical aspects. So there's nothing more we can do from a research side. It's all in, in the political space now. And that's been sitting on the sector of agriculture's desk for probably three or four years. All he needs to do is sign it. And there's no reason why he shouldn't sign it other than politics. And it's all around meat industry. So, so the, the U.S. are saying they want easier access for their meat into South Africa. And, and as soon as they have that, they'll sign up on the citrus. I just want to move your mic a little bit. It's that good pro crow thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes your mic is a little okay. bit too far from your mouth or something no, like that. So, but, but very, very, very interesting conversation. Um, a complete wild card. So, so how is our market access and how is stuff going into Africa from South Africa? Yeah. So Africa is the interesting one. Um, very little. At the moment, we sell less than 1% into Africa of our citrus. Um, probably don't capture all the stuff that just goes across the land border into southern Africa. So it's probably higher than that. I'm sure there are a lot of trucks going from Johannesburg fresh market uh, into Botswana and Zimbabwe and Zambia and wherever. But, um, but we, need to, we need to look at Africa as an opportunity to sell more uh, fruit, specifically into like West Africa, Ghana, um, Nigeria, well, the Nigeria's got actually a big citrus industry, but even not. But um, they own another growing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah they, they, they sort of, I think, one of the biggest in Africa. I mean, apart from us. It's, it's, but is it all consumed locally? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah, they don't export any of it. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, so if you look at apples, apples export. I think forty percent, or they used to. I think with the oil price when it went down, they sold less and might be selling more now. But forty percent of their product went to Africa. Um, and and ours is one percent. You know there must be opportunities to learn from from what the apple industry is doing into Africa and increase it mm -hmm. with the African <coughs> Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, which government's trying to push. Um, that could that could assist. The the problem with Africa is a number of things. One is is um, uh, the red tape to get it into those countries. So there's a lot of documentation, etc. A lot of borders to cross. Um, the logistics, the road network is a mess. Um, you know, you get up beyond perhaps uh, Zimbabwe into Zambia and, and the roads really become impossible to get up further into Africa. And then shipping is just so expensive. I mean, it costs you the same to ship to Ghana as it does to uh, to Rotterdam because of the opportunities, you know, the mm. number of vessels going. Um, and then uh, uh, corruption and um, and then the cold, the cold chain. You know, there's not a lot of investment in, in coal stores and stuff in, in, in the rest of Africa. But, you know, that's happening. And, um, and, and Africa definitely must be part of the 260 plan because uh, some volume is going to have to go there. There's a, when it's the 15th or the 18th of November was the day that the world reached 8 billion people. And it was an interesting statistic that they, they spoke about it on the radio. And um, they said for a country to reproduce itself, or to replace itself, you need to have, I think, 2.2 births per woman. And they looked at all the continents. <clears throat> Asia was sitting at, I think, 2.1 mm -hmm. um, births per woman. Europe was sitting at 1.8. And the U.S. was also just a r hovering on the two, if I'm remembering my yeah. stats correct now. But Africa was sitting at 4.5. <laughs> so... Yeah. 
if it keeps going at the current rate, Europe is going to stagnate, and Africa is going to is going to rise. So yeah. the mouths to feed in Europe is going to be less. Yeah, but I think the other side of the coin is can they afford imported product? You know, mm. so we the we, African, yes, yeah, yes. which which in many countries the middle class is increasing um, in their ability to to purchase uh, imported products, which are a luxury to a certain extent. Yeah. You know. Um, so definitely, the, 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 I mean, you look at ShopRite checkers opening up their stores throughout Africa. You know, there's it, big opportunities to to work with them um, and ensure that that our fruit gets there. The, the only thing about oranges and and citrus that's a bit different, perhaps, than apples, is that it's very easy to grow backyard yes. uh, citrus. You know, I mean, a lot of guys got lemon tree in their backyard yes. for their drinks, etc. So. Um, and that's the same throughout Africa. So there are a lot of backyard trees, etc. That not like an apple. You can't grow, grow an apple tree in the backyard because I understand that pests and diseases will just um, and I, especially in those hot and humid countries around the equator, etc. So look, there's a lot of work to be done in assessing exactly which markets and what market corridors to use and and to um, build up the networks with the importers and the retailers and the wholesalers in those areas but it's it's a job that needs to be done so you know this comes back to the point that that everybody in the value chain needs to be part of this vision because we can't go and do all that it's really the a export agents and the members of the fresh produce exports forum that need to be um, doing that sort of research and doing that sort of work in terms of opening those markets up um, so that's why we need to in fact we've got an engagement with them um, tomorrow um, with the Fresh Price Exporters Forum to talk to him about this. Oh, nice. But also what you're saying, I think, um, connects with the last two years have been, the last two to three years have really been crazy with, with all the world events and all the things that have, that have been influencing everything, including the South African um, fresh produce sector. And um, looking from the outside in, it looks to me that Fruit South Africa's the strengthening and the capacitization, if that's if there is such a word, of Fruit South Africa in the last few years has really helped with being able to stand together as an industry. Do you think that that has has played has that been a benefit with all the problems that have been there? Could you maybe expand on that a little? Yeah, I mean, Fruit South Africa is an interesting organisation because. Um, it it's there as an umbrella to to bring the different fruit industry grower associations and exports forum together to collectively um, um, uh, uh, address any of the issues that are facing us that we all have, and and it definitely has helped in in our engagements with government, our engagements, you know, through Fruit South Africa we have a a, a desk at AgBiz, the Agriculture Business uh, okay. Chamber, and then through that we have access into Busa and then Nedlac. So, so in terms of, of of government interaction and bringing some of the, the pressing problems to the really to the attention of of, of those at the top, um, Fruit South Africa plays a massive role in that, and Fumalani does a, a fantastic job um, in terms of of keeping fruit industry issues at the top of, of the mind. The, I think the, the difficulty with it is that the associations are all quite strong, you know, the yes. individual associations, and 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 it's it's difficult to when there's a really pressing, urgent issue, to just you know to to put that to fruit South Africa and then sit back and 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 not get too much involved in in how it plays out. So I think you know I, I, I feel for Fumalani at times because uh, the associations sometimes take you know take the lead and want to be more perhaps um, driving the process uh, and, and not stepping back a bit and, and giving Fruit South Africa the, the space. Um, but uh, that'll, that'll uh, you know, as long as, as Fruit South Africa continues to, to show progress, then you'll see um, um, the associations more happy to, to, to push it to, to that higher level. Yeah. Okay. And then another big question. The, the issue with the European Union and the um, ambient temperature shipment of citrus, of oranges, where are you with that now? Yeah, so just to put it, it it's, it's not ambient shipment. So okay. it's, 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 we do, we, we've got a thing called the False Codling Moth Management System, yes. FMS. Um, and the FMS is, is, an, is an, probably 
we've been told around the world that's probably the the um, most advanced management system mm. on any pest anywhere, and it's had amazing results. It's brought the number of of FCM um, um, interceptions down mm. to to you know to numbers uh, last year three, for example. The year before we had a, a, a poor year, maybe I think it was fourteen. We're talking about eight hundred thousand tons. That's or, incredible. And, and orange is four hundred thousand tons, but in <coughs> total, it's just eight hundred thousand tons. So, so it's it's been incredibly effective. Okay. Um, there is absolutely no reason for the EU to want to do anything. Um, they didn't. They didn't assess the the the, the strength and FMS at all. Um, they rely on fairly shoddy science. If I may be, I'm sure if anybody listens to them, I get a couple of re reactions to that. But they do. Um, they're not the FCM experts around the world. The FCM experts live in South Africa because FCM is an African pest. It's sometimes called African moth. It's only found in Africa. It's found okay. absolutely nowhere else. Nowhere else in the world. That's quite interesting because it's never managed to establish itself anywhere over how many hundred years of trade. It's never gone anywhere else. It's only in Africa. So it's never, it, it, it's never a larvae got out and established like the no. Mediterranean fruit fly or one no. of those things. No. So, so there have been isolated incidences of false codling moth found in Europe once, and it was uh, in a we. It's believed that it came in from West African um, uh, peppers and found its way into a, um, a greenhouse of some sort, hatched out and flew and got, got found. Um, that's the only one incident we know there. And I think in America there was once one incident, but there's never been a population of, of FCM that's found anywhere in the world. Sure. So, um, you know, that, that's why, you, you know, we, the, the, with the government um, filed for the, the WTO consultations. So through all of our negotiations with the Department mm -hmm. of Agriculture, with the counterparts in the EU, they never managed to, to get the EU to, to be able to look in, at the FMS properly and assess it. Um, there was just this political influence mm -hmm. from Spain, unfortunately, uh, in Brussels that just made them move the, 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 the position further and further away from, from good science and good sense. And um, so then they brought in these new measures and they've got an interim measure for last year and then a strengthened measure for, for 23. Um, and we, we can live with the interim measure. Um, and there is additional um, uh, investment needed in, in coal stores and there's some changes that need to be made, but it, it was, it was, we could live with it. And it did strengthen our FMS to a certain extent um, because now you've got a, 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 a harder shipping uh, temperature um, at, the, at the end of your of your system. But the new one that's come into effect from the first of January is 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 really a killer. Um, it it just means that you've got to now put into all your cold stores etc. forced air cooling to to force the, the the temperatures down inside the fruit. And uh, and that's a whole new investment. So and we don't have that in place. Is that, sorry, is that yeah. on the on packhouse level? No, no, in the in the cold stores. Yeah, before shipping. So so the it has to be signed off that the pulp temperatures got to two degrees before you can ship it. The moment it's five degrees. So yeah. you you think three degrees is not a lot, but to yes, get that fruit down to that that yes. uh, level, it's a lot of energy that we don't exactly, have. In this exactly. So. So that's why the, the Minister Patel and the DTRC um, filed the, 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 the call for consultation. So the, that's, a, that's a filing at WTO that says we've got a dispute, we want to consult on this. And, um, and, and so we're in that consultation phase now. Okay. So they've been to Geneva, they've had the discussions, um, and as far as we know, until now there's been no positive um, outcome to that. What we're asking for is for the interim measures to continue. We're not asking to pull back just the FMS, mm -hmm. which in fact is what sense would do, but we realize that might be a bridge too far for, for, for Brussels and, and the pressure from Spain. So we said, well, let's just stay with the interim measures. Monitor it as we go into the, into the next year. We had, so last year we had three interceptions. One of them was after the interim measures, but they opened the container before the 20 day or whatever it was mm -hmm. uh, period. So in, in effect, that one is null and void because the, the treatment actually hadn't been completed. 
So it's like if you if you take uh, pills for a virus and you yes. say okay, it didn't work, but if you didn't take the last two pills, maybe that's why it didn't work. You know, so um, so that one actually we we've we've indicated to the EU they should they should take off the list. So we had two and those were before the new entry measures. And, so, and did, yeah. did, did they find live interceptions or did um, they claim to be live? Yeah, we we have serious yeah. questions about it. So we've asked them for proof that it's alive and all the rest. Um, and, and that's another big. big Yes. Uh, issue that we have with them because uh, unless they can show us proof um, they can rack up as many interceptions as they want in their numbers you know and and Spain that you know we've seen them do that they just suddenly uh, and, and I think the one was from Italy they sent us a photograph of of this interception it was black you know and when a, when it seems black it's yeah. very much dead you know so we, <laughs> there's, a, there's not a lot of trust in in the system unfortunately at the moment because of the politics Sure. And, and how involved are, are you with these discussions? And I'm not talking about CJ, I'm talking about you specifically. Um, okay, so, so in terms of EU, um, we, we do have a, a, a resource, uh, Dion Jaber, um, who's our EU envoy. Um, and he, he gets very involved in, in, in all of these discussions. And then obviously myself uh, with government. So because it's no, no longer a, a technical issue, if it was a technical issue, we'd leave it with Vaughan Harting, um, Sean Moore and all the CRI people um, that are the experts in the technical side. But it, it's, it's, it's now political. So we have to get involved from the polit political side. So myself, Dion, um, our chairman, um, yeah, we all, we all sort of trying to get the, the politics sorted out now. We also hire trade lawyers um, who, who work on our behalf. And uh, in the consultation phase, we actually also had to get Geneva lawyers involved. So it's not a cheap yeah. uh, exercise in, in this whole thing. But at the same time, if you've got a market like that threat, you have to spend the money. Yeah, because the, the outcome that could potentially be from it is much more than what that would cost. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we don't know what the numbers might be, but maybe a third of our oranges, you know, we won't be able to send to the EU anymore. So it's oh, a big number. Incredible. And so you have no idea on the time frame when you're here? No. So we, we were, I mean, we've been discussed, we discussed with, with Minister Dediza and Minister Patel quite regularly. They keep us updated what's going on and also with um, Ambassador Peters in, in, in Geneva. Um, but the EU are playing the waiting game because they know it's putting us more and more under pressure and then we might give them more concessions, you know. Um, so it should have been resolved before the 31st of December because the new, um, uh, protocols, right? yeah, re new protocols are in effect from 1st of January. So it's, we're in a very difficult position now. Um, and uh, fortunately, our season only starts, really kicks off in May, June with, with big volumes of, of oranges. Because it doesn't affect any of the other um, the other citrus types, um, so we have got a bit of time now. But um, the EU have also, if they do change it, they've got to go through a whole lot of processes on their side, which they say will take two to three months. So we need this resolved as soon as possible. Yes. So exciting, exciting and scary times ahead. I mean, if you're saying you're going up to two sixty million. That's quite something. Um, any any other comments on on looking down the road, the, with yeah. with with going down the road for this? Um, are growers still planting? So it sounds very doom and gloom. <laughs> to plant everything. No, it's exciting actually. Yeah. I think especially if you're making preparation for it. Yeah. Mm. No, I mean the, that's exactly the point. You can you can. Uh, it's either doom or gloom, or it's 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 huge uh, um, opportunity. So. Uh, and we're trying to turn it to the latter because uh, if you sit and 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 go in the doom and gloom scenario, then you know then you're not selling a lot of uh, good news or hope to to the growers. So, um, yeah, the 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 you know in 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 these nine projects now, obviously the logistics, the market demand is part of it. Then, but then there's communication, there's information that comes into it, um, and and then you know. The other area that we've we've never been involved in and used to be done by the, the board in the old days and then um, taken up to some extent by the export agents is market development. Um, you know, um, we don't get involved in promoting the product or promoting South African citrus in, in any of the other, in any of the destinations. We tried a little bit in, in grapefruit in 2010 and 2011. 
and we didn't get a, we, we got enough buy-in from the growers to to get a, a, a levy done and all the rest but we we had some resistance from from some growers so um we don't want to do stuff that that our members don't want us to do so we've got to be very careful about what we what we do and our board is pretty split in terms of those who support us going into market development and those who don't so we're quite different from hort grow they they've got quite a big um, market development yes. uh, mm. portfolio um and we've got to relook at that um, maybe once again maybe it won't be our role maybe it'll be the fresh Produce exports forum or maybe it'll be another sector of the of the industry that needs to take up the market development um thing but to just expect our volumes to increase without actually putting some something in front of the consumer that says, look, come and buy South African citrus rather than buying um, either other products like plums and peaches and whatever, or f buying from one of our other competitors, um, you know, maybe we should be investing a bit in that as well. What was interesting now, the, <clears throat> the cameraman that works with us on one of the live stream things, he had to, over the weekend, he filmed... Uh, golf tournament in Dubai and he sent me photos of South African nectarines on the shelf there, labeled South African. Mm. And and he was a South African there now, but it's one of those things that until he's worked in this industry, he never noticed it. Yeah. That it, it's did you go and you pick up something. Now that we work in this, I always look at what's the cultivar of the thing that I'm that's on the shelf and where it came from because it's it's not interesting to me. Yeah. And I I think the the general public don't know most of that. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing about this country is we produce fantastic fruit. Yes. I mean, I, I travel a lot and uh, from apples to peaches to plums to uh, table grapes, I mean, amazing country in terms of fruit uh, production. And, uh, and, and we've got a really good reputation internationally for that. Um, and, and in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have a whole lot of competition. Yes, we do have South America and Australia, but if you look at the Northern Hemisphere with all those European producers, et cetera, it's, it's much more competitive space. So I think the fruit industry, you know, if you look at South Africa and where we're going as a country and the need to, to stimulate the economy and the dying need to get more people with jobs, um, I, I believe agriculture and fruit in particular and, and tourism are, are obvious low-hanging fruit that... Mm that um that can uh that can help in, in in that quest but the government needs to get a whole heap of things right um energy ports uh road infrastructure crime um things like that um and 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 yeah we just need the leadership that's going to put all of those things right and i think that fruit can play a massive role in in pulling the economy sure. out of it I'm I'm curious, Luke, you and Louise have worked together for quite some time. How did you get involved with the citrus industry? So I, I used to work in uh, with Cane Growers Association. So I've okay. always been uh, in agriculture. I did an agriculture economics degree uh, at Marisburg University. Um, worked at Sadara Agriculture College lecturing and stuff like that for a while. Um, and then um, and then went to Cane Growers for, for many years. So I worked with for growers at that point. And I must say, I, I love working for growers. Um, and then one of my friends is a big citrus farm and they were looking to start CGA because uh, the, the the boards had all um, uh, deregulated. So there was no longer a board and they needed to keep the growers together, particularly around research, because that's yes. key to, to, to our industry. So he approached me and said, would I be interested in moving from cane growers across there? And it looked like an exciting challenge. <laughs> and so, yeah, so um, I... Uh, they also sit in with all their challenges. I follow them. Yeah. And this whole sugar tax thing is quite when, interesting. When was, when was that, that you, that CGA started? I mean, it feels, like, it feels like pre-history. 1999, yeah. Now, I mean, interesting thing about the, this, the, the sugar industry, and it's, it's really sad to see what's happening in the sugar industry now because um, it's, a, it's an amazing industry and it's got most amazing people working in it and... And the leadership there was absolutely amazing. So in this, the sugar industry was, and I think still is, very structured, incredibly structured organization. So there were, you know, and it falls under the Sugar Act. So there's actually, a, um, there's, there's legislation behind how the, the sugar uh, industry performs. Um, and all sugar income is actually shared between growers and millers. Um, so it's not like the grower sells the sugar cane to the mill. 
e-shares and the final consumers um, uh, uh, rands and cents, which is similar to the fruit industries uh, in that the, in most cases the grower remains the owner of the fruit and, and it just gets um, sold by agents uh, along, the, along the chain. So, um, but, but what's been going on in the sugar industry now, unfortunately, it seems that the millers haven't been investing in their, in their mills um, and, um, you know, they've slowly become less and less efficient. They've been closing mills down um, and so the, the cane growers are left with all, all the sugar and they can't crush it. I mean, last year, a few mills could only crush 80% of, of the capacity oh, of, wow. the, uh, of those areas. So, so the guys are looking at changing. South coast of KZN now is macadamias galore, um, taking over from those uh, sugarcane fields. Um, and I don't know what will happen to the rest of the industry. And now with Tonga tulips and the in the mess that it's in at the moment uh, with rescue packages going around oh, one uh, one's a bit worried about mm. the sugar industry and it's come from this amazing position it was in and in terms of transformations we haven't really touched on um they were they've been leaders in the agricultural space for years and years they, they had um, um small grower programs funding uh, for the growers uh, milling capacity etc um, so really leaders there and, and when I moved across I tried to take sort of the better parts that I saw in the, in the sugar industry and try and um, put in structures and systems in, in the citrus industry that would be similar to, to the best parts in the sugar industry and, um, and, and learnt a lot from, from the sugar industry. Okay. Um, so we have a grower development company now, Lukanya and Kombisa heads it up and, uh, and that's a seriously important part of our um, future and when you look at vision 260 the one thing when i met with the dg we agreed on was that the vision 260 must have strong transformation element in other words we must be saying of that 260 how much of that is black owned cartons of citrus that's going to be exported and then we have to set a goal and then you don't set a goal and leave it and hope that it might happen we've got to actually then go about make it happen and what makes it so difficult now is that the hardest hit by these um, the downturn in the industry are the smaller scale mm -hmm. black growers because A, they don't have reserves, B, a lot of them haven't got title, etc., so they can't go and raise loans. They don't have a, those who do have title don't have a track record, so, so to get loans from government, uh, from the banks is not all, all that easy at the moment. And they need money now to prepare 2023 crop. In fact, it's probably even a bit too late now. They needed money in October, November, mm. and nothing came back to them from last year's exports. Mm. So, so this year's crop is in jeopardy for for a lot of those uh, black growers. So, for for it's going to be a, 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 a huge uphill battle to make sure that the 8,000 hectares under black grower ownership at the moment continues to to uh, to be looked after and. And prepared for next because the um the legislation is that 25 percent or 20 percent of levies got to be spent on yeah uh, on the um transformation the, on the transformation part. yeah and and also training <clears throat> yeah so transformation covers various aspects mm -hmm. as enterprise development training and whatever so for for our in our case i mean just remember our, our levy is is like over 200 million it's about two forty million. So if you're talking about twenty percent, talking about forty million rand. So it's a, it's not a, it's not a huge amount. I mean, to to nowadays, if you want to establish a hectare of citrus, probably five hundred thousand rand. So it's not a, it's not a huge amount of money, but it does give us a good little um, basis upon which to then attract other money in um, to assist the the, the black row. So. That 40 million is spent between the, the Grow Development Company and the Citrus Academy. And the Academy obviously is, is in human skills development and that sort of thing. So between the two of them, um, uh, we, you know, they, we, we, they'll work on the plan going forward as to how we're going to get more black growers, um, increase their volumes, etc. And we've got, from that, we've got a very exciting uh, jobs fund project, um, which is over 300 million rand. Um, Half of it, or roughly forty percent grant, sixty percent loan with uh, First National Bank as the as the loan partner, and um, and that'll increase I think black owned hectares by about two thousand hectares, um, and bring in uh, sorry bring in two thousand jobs and 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 bring in a, a fair amount of hectares, probably about two thousand hectares as well. So, why wow, is that happening right now? Yeah, yeah. That's so very exciting. It, it's 
been going for we had a little bit of a, a blimp in the beginning because we had to change the lending partner. Um, but uh, it's been going for this year and March will be three years and we've got an extension for another year. So that we, we've got till March 2024. I know I uh, know that the Hort Crow yeah. actually also got, they had a whole big jobs fund drive and all the yeah. rest. So that's very, that's very, very exciting because it it's is, going yeah. to give those people that just need that little bit of a help up. Yeah. It's going to assist them. Exciting yeah. to hear. Yeah, so Hort has got a bit of a different model. They've got Hort Fin, um, yes. which is sort of an established body. We don't have a have a have a, a, a joint venture organisation of any mm. sort like Hort Fin, but we've got a um, a committee structures etc. with FNB, um, the other. So um, uh, Delrad are also uh, have got some grant funding in it as well. Um, Agri Cita have got some funding in it as well. Um, and 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 ourselves. Um, so, the, the different funders sit on those committees, and we've had you know applications in which have been considered by those committees and uh, and approved or not approved as 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 we go through the process. Um, yeah, and so by March this year, we will have committed that three hundred million. Um, a lot of it has been paid out already. Uh, unfortunately, the the downturn means because that runs. Remember, there's a jobs fund project, so it's about jobs mm. uh, primarily. You've, got to, be, you've yeah. got to be employing people. Exactly. So, so, so it's all been about expansion, or where you re rehabilitating an orchard that that had you know that had nobody employed on that orchard because it was non-functional. Mm. So, so it's either bringing that orchard back to life or or a new orchard and. You know, a lot of guys aren't looking at expansion now, they're looking at survival. So some, unfortunately, some applicants have, have pulled out, even though they were successful because they've said, look, we can't think about putting another 10, 15 hectares and now we just have to s preserve the 50 hectares we've got, mm. you know. Um, so, yeah, so, so it, it is making it a little bit difficult on the expansion side. Um, and the Grow Development Company, they've also, whereas we used to say, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't fund you know, your, your fertilizer, your chemicals, or your, your packaging, we will fund expansion because that's what you want to do. We've, we've actually changed that and, and we're actually helping fund the inputs now because what you've said is no use mm. saying, okay, we've got 8,000 hectares, we're going to go to 10,000 and, and then finding you actually got 6,000. Yeah, you can't pack the 10,000. Yeah, well, and, 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 and the guys can't uh, prepare the, the 8,000. So we said rather let's preserve the 8,000. And make sure that those eight thousand yes. uh, survive. Yeah. And 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 how, with you coming around to a lot of places and a lot of people, what's the the vision like for young people to come into the industry? Because we, it's been a discussion, and most of these things is the young people don't find agriculture sexy anymore, but yet they consume what agriculture does. Mm -hmm. Before you answer the question, <clears throat> I'm going to interrupt you and say, we have a little tradition that we've started where we have the previous person we interview ask a anonymous question for the next person. Uh, okay. And it actually links with that one. So the question, a little bit more pointed, is what are you and potentially CGA doing to assist young people to join um, the, the agricultural sector and to bolster the agricultural sector for the future? Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, with, within the academy, we've got a bursary fund of, uh, I think it's, I'm trying to remember the number now, two and a half million or so. So there are about 70 students that are um, funded through that bursary fund and uh, in various different um, stages. So some at agriculture colleges, some at uh, undergrad, some at postgrad. Um, and then within the academy, they've got a, you know, very um, uh, structured way of dealing with bursary students. So they get placed onto to farms during their vacation. Um, so you can see if there's a fit with, with, with employment after they finish, because what we're trying to do is make sure people don't just come out with paper, they come out with a job. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of unemployed graduates around now, so we don't want to add to that number. We want to make sure that the graduates that come through actually go into employment. So a lot of work done at, at the academy in terms of, of um, the development. We try and fund some of them to go to conferences, um, if possible, overseas, now that we're getting to travel a little bit more. Um, 
So that's a big, a big um, uh, target for us. Uh, but interesting enough, we, we do roadshows around the industry every two years, um, and we have the summit uh, in, in the other the other year. And the number of young people at those roadshow meetings is 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 um, is really comforting because. Um, I remember Chris White, who heads up um, the Eurofruit and, and those, uh, he once said to me, you can tell the um, the health of an industry by the number of young people in the audience when you go to a conference and or, or what are the meetings or whatever. And, and I must say, going around the industry, I just saw a lot of young people involved, which was quite heartening um, for the future. So. I think they are there, and um, and and through the bursary fund, we're trying to push, you know, more and more youngsters into into the space. Good. You touched on the the Citrus Academy. You kind of spoke about it in general, but I think what is really remarkable from the citrus industry perspective is the birth and growth and um, expansion of the Citrus Academy, and how many people it's helped in its fifteen years of of existence. Yeah. So. I mean, 15 years on, those first students that you helped are probably well into their careers and established. And um, the capacity that that's created over the one and a half decades it's existed is remarkable. I'm yeah. sure you must come into contact with these people that have yeah. been assisted. I've forgotten the exact numbers now, but um, they did analysis to see how many of those stayed in the citrus industry, how many of those stayed in agriculture. And it was a huge percentage of them stayed in agriculture and a fair percentage stayed in citrus. So, you know, that's quite important because one doesn't want to invest in all of this and find your expertise is going off to, to other sectors. So it's been, yeah, it's been very heartening to see um, the the number of, of them that are still with us. And and often I bump into to people in, in different places, say, oh, I was, a, I was an academy student. I, I don't know them all because I'm not that close to them. I do meet them uh, from time to time at, at conferences and functions, you can always see them because they they brightly coloured um, t-shirts, etc. That um, and they they move in a in a mass um, and make a lot of noise. So you, you do see them at conferences and and um, and those sort of things. So and and they always what what's amazing is their enthusiasm, um, and you sort of really get a um, a good feeling once you've been with them because they're so enthusiastic about the future and what they're doing, etc. So. I think the academy is doing amazing work, and um, and and you know, long may we continue to invest in in the youth because you know they they're the future. And um, uh, if you look, you know, even back before the Artspan used to have a bursary fund, yeah, and and if you look at the top echelon of people at CRI, most of those people came through with a with an Artspan bursary. So we have to keep that going um, to 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 keep getting well-equipped people into the industry. Um, is CRI also one of the subsidiaries of CGA or yeah. is it an entity on its own? So the way the way we, we operate in terms of what we call the CGA group is that when we have a, a, um, a, a focus area that needs its own attention, then we give it its own company and its own management, its own board, um, and it manages it manages those functions. Because if you look at the CGA board, the CGA board is really a political board in that we have representation from each different region on our board. <coughs> so um, whereas you, you don't want politics to get too influencing your research agenda. So on the research um, um, CRI, which is the Citrus Research International, the, the research place, um, what we make sure is that there's a majority of grower representation on the board. So they've got a board of 11, six of them are grower representatives because he who pays um, must say as well. Mm -hmm. um, but they do their own, they, they're completely independent from us in terms of their governance. Um, we obviously fund a, a grant into, into the, through the Citrus Research Trust through to CRI and therefore we do look at their budget and, and approve their budget on an annual basis. But they and, and they've got committees uh, on which growers sit, etc., determining the research agenda, um, research expenditure, etc. Um, and so we've got that body. Then we've got academy, similarly its own board, its own management. We've got the CGA Grow Development Company, own board, own management. 
Um, we've got the CJ Cultivar company, same thing. I saw that. It yeah. popped up on social media not too long ago. Okay, yeah. And then we've got River Bioscience and, and Exit, which are commercial um, uh, companies, also with their own board, also with grow a CGA representation on the board. Um, so yeah, there's, that's how we structure ourselves so that we, we, we allow those, those um, boards and management to, to get on with the jobs um, and yeah. don't interfere too much if they're doing a good job. Yeah, and they are. Yeah, they are, yeah. And if, if you've got a message to the general, the, the general public out there about the citrus industry and about the future, it's a big one, but and very broad, but there must be something, you know, to say to people out there about the citrus industry. What would you say? No, I, th I think the thing is to um, to support the, the 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 idea of 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 the Vision Two Hundred and Sixty from from the CJ board because uh, everybody's got a, a role to play in it, um, and although it's very export focused and therefore the general consumer in South Africa perhaps won't see the benefit. I mean, there's, uh, there's more than enough citrus for, for the local uh, consumer, etc. I think the, the advantages for the country um, in terms of employment, I mean, every hectare of citrus that we have is, is, is a job um, on the farm. So we've got 100,000 hectares, that's 100,000 jobs. Um, in the pack houses, there's another probably 20,000 jobs. And then if you just think about rural towns and villages and, and, and um, you know, you look at Edo, Citrusdale, um, Let's see, Tele, all these little towns that have got a, um, a, a doctor and an accountant and a, all these other people, you know, doing their business in these little rural towns, etc. They all depended upon the, the agricultural industry that goes on around them. And those that have got citrus around them are keeping the, the those um, those towns alive, uh, mm. and and so we just say you know support us, um, and uh, and and uh, in our quest to to get all the role players engaged, and and um, to buy into the vision as we go forward. Because not just those people. If you look at to expand by a hundred million, you're going to need pack houses. You're going to need equipment. You're going to need builders. Cold, cold storage. Gonna, it, it's a yeah. never-ending cycle. Transport. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's every sector. I mean, if you go to the, the labeling, then you've got the glue that goes on the yes. labeling. You know, it's a, you go to the straps that tie down the, the, the pallets. You know, there's just yes. a multitude of, of, of people that are actually, you know, it'd be probably quite an interesting exercise to actually see the um, multiplier effect of, of, of the industry in terms of how many people are actually got some stake. In but but not, not just with this growth. Currently, as it is oh, yeah. at the moment, I don't think a lot of people, I don't think the guy sitting in the glue factory who's designing the glue mm. to go onto a label thinks that he's connected to agriculture. Yeah. But yes, he is very much so. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm. No, no, even, I mean, if you look at the fruit industries as a whole, they they support a lot of families in, in, in South Africa. And, um, and if you speak to the general guy on the street, you say to him, agriculture, like, because we do photos and videos and all this, often I get to people and I say, what do you do? I said, no, I, I do photos and videos. Do you do weddings? I said, well, I used to. <laughs> so what do you do now? I said, I do agriculture. And it's like as if you're throwing a bucket of cold water on them. Yeah. They can't believe that we are focusing just on this. Yeah. And it's an incredible industry to be in. Yeah, absolutely. I remember somebody once saying, if you take a photograph of a whole group of, of, of farmers and you take take one face in that picture and you think about the people that that person is responsible for, not just their own family, not just their own works, their staff, mm. but the seasonal workers that come in from, from where they buy the, the, the plant, mm -hmm. even the IP people before the plant, the nursery, the transport from the nursery to their property, the inputs in the orchard, um, the sprinklers, the, um, all of that, the accountant that has to do all of the work, the person in the pack house, and then from there, post harvest, all the way down to the port, onto the ship. The number of people that that farmers actually, who, whose pocket he's putting money into is phenomenal. And yeah. people don't stop and do that sum, as yeah. you were saying, the multiplier effect. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's, that's the only time they realize it is when the farm is gone. Yes. And then it's too late, you know, and that's what we're trying to get into everybody's heads now is 
think about them now while they in this difficult position. And let's do what we can to to keep them in it. You know, the, on the ground, the, the the issue around agriculture is not just food industries are taking strain at the moment. You know, we listen to to dairy farmers, potato farmers. I mean, they a lot of the sectors are in serious dire straits. I think the only one that's probably doing quite well now for a change is the grain industry because of good rain and, and stuff mm. like that. And the good prices. Yeah, and good prices. So, but but I mean, they were in dire straits. Five years ago, so or whatever, four years ago. So, it, there are cycles, but um, but at, at the moment, agriculture as a, as a whole is is actually finding it very difficult. And we had a, I mean, on, on energy and load shedding, we had a discussion with Minister Deza last Friday, and uh, you know, listening to the you know, like chicken slaughtering, for example, Ooh. they they can't slaughter the chickens now because the the fridges go off, you know. So so now KFC is not getting enough chickens. And then, uh, you know, people are saying we must import more. Well, if you import more, then those jobs are gone forever. Yeah, um, they also need to keep cold. Yeah, they have, to stay, they have to stay cold. And the same with potatoes, chips, you know. The, um, once you've harvested and cut it up into your things, it's got to remain in the, in the cold chain. So I, I don't know where load shedding is going. It really tells me it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but at the moment, it's not, it's not tenable for... A lot of, and it's not just agriculture. I'm sure. Yes. If you go to butcheries and bakeries and all these other, they have the same problems. All but, connected to agriculture. Yeah, but they're all mm. connected. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much. I think um, if you've got any kind of a closing goodbye, thank you. You, we, we and, can and, we can wrap up. And we need to get a question from him when we're done. Yes, when we're done, we'll get yeah. a question from you. But if I think we we've chatted, if there's anything else you want to add, we can we can wrap up. I think the, the the one addition I'd have, or one thing I'd like to say, is is anybody in the value chain who have suggestions for us? We we don't know. We don't have all the answers. We we have a lot of questions as well. So you know, if if you have suggestions for us, how can we do things better? How can we make sure that two hundred and sixty happens? What should we be doing differently going forward? We are open to any suggestions um, as we go forward. Thank, Thank you please. very much. Thank you for your time, Justin. Thanks we really so much. appreciate it. Thank you.